Uh, for those of you who've never been here before, my name is Doug Bradburn. I'm the founding director of the Fred W. Smith National Library for the study of George Washington. I'm competing with this beautiful Baroque music, which is putting me in the mood, but uh, maybe interfering with your ability, there we go, to, uh, to hear the nuances in my voice. But, uh, you know, th this is such a, a great program, I think, we do here, these forward evening book talks, these free book talks. Uh, for people in the area, generously sponsored by Ford, who, as you all know, has been a great supporter of Mount Vernon, going back to Henry Ford's enthusiasm for George Washington and his enthusiasm to make sure the house wouldn't burn down. And he gave the first fire engine to Mount Vernon. And so Ford continues their sponsorship really with many things for the estate, uh, including the American celebration that we did on July 4th this year. All those programs are sponsored by Ford. Uh, many of the books that have been published by Mount Vernon, and now this continuing relationship with the Ford Evening Book Talk, which is a chance that I originally envisioned and still envision it is really bringing academic scholars to the general public much more and try to get young historians who are writing their first books in front of audiences of interested folks, because I know that you know about the David McCulloughs and the Joe Ellis's and the Pulitzer Prize winners of the world, but it's really important that young uh, scholars get exposure to a discriminating, uh, tasteful audience like the one that we can, we can bring forward. So tonight we've got a really excellent uh, book and speaker, and let me go ahead and, and get right to it. This is uh, Cassandra Good, Dr. Cassandra Good, uh, currently the associate editor of the papers of James Monroe at the University of Mary Washington. She has a BA and MA in American Studies from George Washington University, which we like to see, and of course her PhD from the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, Penn is the center of some of the best early American history being written. Uh, there's the McNeil Center of Early American History and Culture there, run by Dan Richter, who's a great scholar of Native American history. Uh, Cassie worked on a committee with two of the giants in the field, really, uh, and, uh, and so it's great to see her emerging as a star herself. Uh, she's taught numerous places. Uh, she's had a curatorial research association with the American Revolution Center, which will be opening. This is the museum, right, that's going to open in uh, sometime soon, uh, the, uh, 2017, uh, in Philadelphia. She's been the recipient of numerous fellowships and research appointments. Let me list a few of them. A research associate at the McNeil Center, Quinn Foundation Fellow uh, from the University of Pennsylvania, Annenberg History Fellow, Pew Presidential Fellowship, uh, the Presidential Prize Research Fellowship at Penn, and of course, most importantly, she is a fellow of the Fred W. Smith National Library for the Study of George Washington. She's actually been a fellow here this summer, and uh, so it's a really nice treat to have a, a standing fellow uh, who's a published author uh, giving a book talk to this audience. She's widely published in different publications, uh, and tonight she's here to talk about her first book, Founding Friendships, Friendships Between Men and Women in the Early American Republic. Please, everybody welcome Cassandra Good. Thank you for the very kind introduction. I'm really pleased to be here tonight and have such a wonderful audience who's come in from the finally nice weather uh, to come hear about founding friendships tonight. And tonight I'm going to talk to you a bit about how I came to write this book and walk you through the themes of the book, the big questions I was asking. And throughout, I'm going to focus on George Washington and his family members. Uh, so this is the special George Washington edition. Um, Pretty much all the examples I'm talking about also show up in the book, so there is a lot about George Washington and his family members in this story. Uh, and finally, at the end, I'll give you a sense of some of the bigger takeaways, why this matters, both for understanding Washington, the historical time period, and even our society today. So to start with how I came to write this book. There will be another slide of that at the end <laughs> for anybody who wanted a picture of that. Um, this actually started with Thomas Jefferson and a woman he was friends with named Margaret Bayard Smith. 
Smith is a Washington society woman who moves to Washington with Jefferson's presidency. Her husband edits Jefferson's new administration newspaper, the National Intelligencer. And she becomes very close friends with Jefferson during his presidency. And she wrote a letter to her sister in March 1809, the night she said goodbye to Jefferson when Madison's inauguration had happened and Jefferson was returning to Monticello. And while that's fairly close to Washington by car now, that would have been a pretty long distance. She didn't know if she was ever going to see him again. So she wrote her sister, my eyes are so blinded with tears that I can scarcely trace these lines. And she went on to tell the story of seeing Jefferson at the White House. When I saw our dear and venerable Mr. Jefferson, my heart beat. When he saw me, he advanced from the crowd, took my hand affectionately and held it for five or six minutes. And when I first saw this, about 12 years ago, I thought, oh, I have discovered an affair with Thomas Jefferson. <laughs> and then I came to realize that, in fact, men and women talked about friendship in very different ways in the past, in ways that sound romantic to us now, even though they may not have been. And I could certainly connect with this idea that men and women could be friends. Um, I had seen the movie When Harry Met Sally. I knew that this was a somewhat controversial topic. But as I read more and more in letters from the period, I began to discover that, in fact, there were many friendships between men and women in this period. So first to define for you what I mean by friendship here, because the word friend could be used for a lot of different things at this period. It could mean a patron. You might refer to your spouse as a friend. Um, it could just be a business relationship. But what I'm talking about here are affectionate, reciprocal relationships that the men and women called friendship and that they had the choice to enter or leave, uh, which is not the case in a family or a marital relationship. And these are people who are not related to one another, even as siblings-in-law. At the time, a sibling-in-law was basically the same as a blood sibling. In many states, there were incest prohibitions from marrying that person. So it's a different relationship. Also, I'm really talking here about elite and middling class people because of the kind of sources I'm looking at, which is largely people's letters and diaries. It's the elite and upper middle class people who are leaving those sources. And so hopefully another historian will figure out a way to get at lower classes of people who were not keeping these sorts of records. I think that there is probably something there. But for this study, I focused mostly on this one set of people. And of course, I start with the assumption that these friends are, po these friendships are possible. People are not just calling each other friends as some kind of ruse. This is real. But I don't use the term platonic, which we might use today, because platonic at the time meant romantic but unconsummated. So it's a different kind of use of that term than what we would use today. So really, there is no term at the time for a male-female friendship. So it's a little awkward of a construction to say that, but that is really the most accurate way to put it. And I structured the book around questions of how these friendships actually worked. So to begin with, what did people gain from these relationships? First, in many cases, people got surrogate family members. This is a period where people lost family members quite frequently, uh, siblings, parents, spouses, and so friends could serve that role um, one person that you may have heard of from Virginia, John Randolph uh, of Roanoke, Virginia, who was known usually for being uh, sort of difficult, mercurial, sometimes mean-spirited when he was in Congress. He had a friend who passed away, and this friend, Joseph's wife, Delia, became very close friends with John Randolph. And Randolph, in fact, helped raise several of the Bryan children. So that became a sort of surrogate spouse relationship. Randolph was unmarried. Delia Bryan never married again. And they had this very close relationship where he offered advice on raising her children. Then I have another example here from the Washington family. This is George Washington's step-granddaughter, Eliza Park Custis, later law or temporarily. Um, and she was not particularly close with her family from everything I can tell. I think especially she may have been a little bit closer with her sister Nellie, but does not appear to have been particularly close with her brother. 
And she also didn't really have a father figure in her life. Uh, and she became friends with a man named David Bailey Warden, who had lived in Maryland and then moved to France for various diplomatic and business posts. And she really saw him as a surrogate brother. And when he was leaving for France, she wrote, at parting with me, when tears attested to your sorrow, you solemnly promised ever to be my faithful friend, ever to feel a brother's affection for me, and to do me service if in your power. And she assured him that she felt a sister's affection for him. And in fact, she did uh, help him in certain ways. He helped her. Uh, and I'll get to how they helped each other with politics a bit later. Both Eliza and Nellie saw Lafayette as a father figure. Of course, their father died very young. Here's an image of Lafayette from the collection here. And as you probably know, Lafayette was sort of a surrogate son to George Washington. So the Custis girls knew him when they were growing up. They wrote to him regularly, and they spent a lot of time with him when he came to the U.S. on his tour in 1824 to 25. And in their letters, some of which are here in the archives, uh, he styled himself as their paternal tender friend. They referred to him as father. He sometimes referred to himself as father. The closings of his letters to them always brought up this family connection. He would remind Eliza of my affectionate sympathy and paternal love. He sent along the sympathies and love of your old paternal friend and send his love and blessing most truly, tenderly, and paternally. So he's emphasizing in his letters this fatherly relationship. And as you can tell from those sorts of closings, and especially in these uh, familial type relationships, emotional support was a quite important benefit that people received from these relationships. Even if somebody was married, they couldn't get all of their emotional support from a spouse. Some of that would come from a friend. They also, in many cases, if one was older than the other, had a sort of mentorship relationship. So the friend could provide the other one, and it's not always men providing women. It could go in the other direction. Advice, um, help them with getting a job or with intellectual improvement. And certainly intellectual stimulation is an important benefit to these relationships, too. This is a period where women's education is becoming seen as quite important, at least for elite women. And elite women are supposed to be able to have an intellectual conversation with a man. They are supposed to be able to talk about politics and literature. So these friendships certainly offered a venue for that. And the friendship between Jefferson and Abigail Adams, who you see on the cover of my book in the non-George Washington edition, um, is one friendship that really shows all of these qualities. What you're seeing here is a letter from Abigail Adams to Thomas Jefferson that is in the Jefferson Papers at the Library of Congress. Her handwriting is not the easiest to read. Fortunately, most of these letters are published at this point. And the letters between them are really quite affectionate. Um, there's also exchanges of favors, whether that's sharing political information or political advice in both directions. Uh, Jefferson certainly relied on Abigail in many cases to actually, after the Adams left Paris and went to London uh, and back to the United States, Jefferson did shopping for them. Abigail would send particular commissions. This is something that if you had a friend in Paris, whether it was a man or a woman, that person could do shopping for you. That was an important friendship to have. And these letters are really witty, intellectual, often fun letters to read. Um, some of the famous quotes from Jefferson joking about being a vegetarian or saying we need a little revolution now and then, those are in letters to Abigail Adams. So if we see all of this affection and playfulness in these letters, how can we tell the difference between a friendship and a romance? And that's probably the trickiest question of all to answer in this book, especially because, as I mentioned, people called their spouse friend. So just the word friend does not necessarily tell us what the difference is. Now, back to that definition I gave, I didn't mention whether sexuality was part of this or not, because I don't think that's really an important part of the definition. There were what we would call now friends with benefits, and there were certainly men and women who were attracted to one another but were still friends. Just because there was attraction didn't negate a friendship. 
There's also the fact that people at the time were sometimes confused about the status of their relationship, just as people today might be. So if you look at diaries at the time, you can see people describing how they're not really sure how they feel. There's even one letter I write about in here where a woman talks to her male friend trying to figure out the status of their relationship because she's not really sure if they're dating or friends and they have a conversation about it. And part of this confusion comes from the fact that, as I mentioned, the term platonic friendship doesn't really exist and there's no category in society at the time for this type of relationship. When you don't have the language to describe something with and you don't have a concrete category for it, it makes it much more difficult to think through and understand the status of a relationship. There's also the challenge of how society viewed these friendships, and I devote a chapter to that, because in fact, society had rather negative opinions on these relationships. This is the title page from a notably later edition of a very popular novel at the time called The Coquette. The most popular novels in this period, at least at the early part of the early republic, were seduction novels. And what would happen in these novels is that a young, innocent woman would meet a man who, in many cases, used the term friendship and tried to befriend her, and then, under the guise of friendship, seduced her, she would become pregnant and die, a sort of tragic death. So we see that the end of a friendship between a man and a woman is death. Uh, <laughs> so that's a pretty negative outcome. Uh, the other option is if you had a more lighthearted novel, like a Jane Austen novel, the end of a friendship would be marriage. But either way, that friendship does not persist. So the idea in the literature is that friendships are either dangerous or impossible. I want to read to you a bit from an advice book. This is a very popular advice book um, by a man who styled himself Father Gregory, writing to his niece, Susanna. And he said, beware then, Susanna, of friendship from a man. A man might assume the mask of friendship in order to seduce her. And he gave the following example. A friend had given him advice on dealing with a young woman once and said, if she is not to be gained by the common modes, make a pretension of being her friend. The author saw this as a prime example of friendship being prostituted to screen the most infamous purposes. Then you have another book that's a sort of didactic novel, an advice novel. It had a little poem with a similar sort of advice that warned the helpless fair in friendship with the other sex. Be cautious, they are apt to vex. So there is this notion in society that friendships are impossible or dangerous or can't last. And even, you know, you may know that there were many condu conduct books, letter writing guides, etiquette books. None of these had advice on conducting a friendship with the opposite sex. So there's really little to no guidance from society about how to do this. So then the question becomes, how did people make these friendships work and appear safe and proper, given that there's a worry that these could be sort of false friendships that are actually leading to seduction? People had to be very conscious of those worries, especially since gossip at this time could really destroy a woman's reputation and mean she couldn't get married. So there are a variety of strategies for this, and one goes back to this idea of surrogate family. People would uh, reference their friends as family members, brother or sister, mother or father. You saw Lafayette doing that. Um, and so this is part of a larger strategy of just embedding that friendship in a larger group, including a third party. So if you're using that sibling language, you're including this in a larger family group. People might also use religious language and include God as the third party to that relationship. For evangelicals in this period, friendship was a way to reach God. And if you look at their letters, you see that God is really described as a third party to that relationship. And then finally, in marriages, including the spouse was a really important thing to do to make that friendship appear proper and to make sure that that marriage did not have trouble because of this friendship. So it's very common to include the spouse. Now, going back to this example of family language, here we have another Washington step-granddaughter, uh, usually known as Nellie Custis. 
And she got quite upset when there was a newspaper story that apparently said she was going to marry Lafayette's son, George Washington Lafayette, who had been living for a little while at Mount Vernon. And she insisted to her friend that she would ever feel an interest and sincere regard for my young adopted brother, but that as to being in love with him, it is entirely out of the question. So by using the term brother here, and she does say adopted brother, but still this term brother suggests this is a family relationship. This is not a romantic relationship. And when it comes to the spouse example, certainly when George Washington wrote to his female friends, he often included Martha's good wishes at the end of the letter. And we can see that in the closing to the bottom letter here. Uh, and certainly in letter writing, men and women had to be quite careful about how they used emotional language, how they opened a letter and closed it, that opening and closing at the that beginning and ending was sort of a formulaic thing that could signal the status of the relationship. And what you see here is these letters, this top one is from Thomas Jefferson to Angelica Schuyler Church. At the end, he says, write to me sometimes and permit me to answer your letters. God bless you, my dear madam, your affectionate friend, Thomas Jefferson. This kind of closing might sound pretty affectionate to us, but compared to what somebody in a romantic relationship would use, where they'd reference love or the word heart, those were very commonly used words. That just does not come up in letters with male-female friend pairs. Here at the bottom, you see a very lengthy sign-off from George Washington to his friend Annis Boudinot Stockton, who I'll talk about a little bit later. And you can see here he references the joint good wishes of Mrs. Washington and myself. So he's bringing Martha into this relationship. And that is both, you know, the fact that Martha did know her and would have been friendly with her, but it's also a strategic decision there. And People have to do this because letters are not as private as we might think in this period. First of all, if you were sending something from overseas, there was no international mail. The only way mail got back and forth was you found somebody to carry it for you. And it was sealed with a little bit of wax. And certainly somebody would know if you broke the seal, but it was pretty common for letters being sent across the Atlantic to have been intercepted or read at some point. So especially for a public figure, they had to be aware of this. There's also the fact that in many cases, when somebody received a letter, they were expected to share it with their social circle. They were expected to pass it around to people for them to read it or to read it aloud to a group of people. So a letter could be passed around an entire neighborhood. Uh, so these are not private conversations. Um, these are certainly public documents, and that's why that positioning is so important. Friends also exchange gifts, and I have a chapter in the book devoted just to how complicated it was to know what kind of gift was appropriate to give between male-female friends. One gift that was appropriate was poetry. And here's Annis Boudinot Stockton, who I just mentioned, and a poem that she wrote and sent to George Washington. Uh, she wrote a number of poems about him. And in this period, men and women who were friends could exchange poetry. Sometimes it was on a sheet of paper like this that you just gave somebody. Sometimes it was in a special album that somebody kept that friends would sign with sometimes a copied poem, sometimes an original one and their signature. But the unusual thing about poetry is you could actually say more than you felt in poetry. Unlike in letters, you could be a lot more effusive in poetry without anybody worrying about it because this was a special form of literature. And these were often published in newspapers. There were exchanges of poems between male, female friends that were published and they were much more effusive than letters. So one section of this poem here starts, Oft times when rapture swells the heart, expressive silence can impart. More full the joy sublime, thus Washington, my wandering mind, in every grateful ardor joined, the words were out of time. The muse of Morvan's peaceful shade, she lived at a place called Morvan, gave way to all the gay parade for transport of her own. So these words like rapture and ardor and transport, these are usually 
associated with romance. But because of this format, these are acceptable. And then she goes on throughout the rest of the poem to praise his leadership and uh, his importance as a public figure in the new nation. Here we see a miniature of George Washington. People did exchange uh, both portraits and miniatures, but usually miniatures were only exchanged in romantic relationships. The exception to this is if you had somebody like George Washington whose image was already widely distributed. So in his case, or somebody like Benjamin Franklin, whose image was everywhere, uh, those men could share miniatures. And the reason this was usually just between romantic pairs is that a miniature was viewed differently than a portrait. A portrait could be up on a wall. You would view it from a distance in a public space. But a miniature, the idea was, and there are even novels describing how people would interact with a miniature. You would hold it, and it had to be close to your face to see the detail, and then you would carry it in a pocket or a locket that was close to your heart. So that close connection made it a much more romantic object. And you see here this miniature that actually Nellie owned this, but a engraving of it was made in multiple copies, and Washington gave this to several female friends. You can see him here as a sort of distant Cincinnatus figure. He looks like you know, a Roman god, maybe, and you, we don't really see a lot of intimate detail. Whereas this Ramage miniature, uh, this particular one was given to his wife, and this is a much more intimate image. You can imagine holding this up close to inspect it. It also had his hair uh, woven across the back of it, and so that made it a much more intimate piece. Here again, we have... George's hair, because in fact, hair was another object that it was okay for friends of the opposite sex to exchange. That might seem weird or creepy to us now, but hair was a pretty commonly um, distributed gift at the time. It will occasionally fall out of historic letters you're looking at or albums, especially in the Victorian period. People get really uh, excited about hair jewelry that, you know, at first this was made from hair of people they knew or deceased people, it got to the point they would buy hair jewelry just from a store with hair from somebody they did not know. So hair became a commodity at a certain point. But this piece actually, um, and this is a piece that is owned by Mount Vernon, was owned by a friend of George Washington's named Elizabeth Walcott. Her husband had been in Washington's administration, and at the end of the administration, they were at a gathering, and Elizabeth told Martha Washington that she wanted a lock of George Washington's hair. And the story goes, Mrs. Washington instantly took her scissors and with a happy smile cut a large lock from her husband's head, added it to one from her own, and presented them to her friend. So who knows whether this is apocryphal or if this is actually how Mrs. Walcott got the lock of hair, but she certainly had enough hair that she made three different jewelry pieces, and it is inscribed on the back of this or engraved saying that this is George Washington's hair. And you certainly see his hair come up in a lot of different places, probably not all his. But in this case, we've got a fair grasp on the fact this was probably his hair, and this is an appropriate gift. Part of why it's appropriate, even though we might think of it as something fairly intimate, first of all, it's free to give this to somebody. And second of all, it's an inexhaustible resource, pretty much. Uh, certainly, if we look at how much hair of George Washington's was distributed, he grew plenty of hair to give away. And it also is something that lasts forever. If you come across hair in a letter now, I mean, this is in a glass case, but even in a letter, it does not decay. So this is something you can give that's literally a piece of yourself as a gift to a friend that is entirely appropriate. So I've talked a lot about friendships between men and women with George Washington and other political figures. So the final chapter of this book asks what these friendships me meant at the time for political life. And pretty much all of the founding era presidents had female friends, as did most elite men. There is just ample evidence that these friendships occurred frequently between elite men and women. When a politician is involved, though, there's another dimension here where you have exchange of political access, 
influence and information. And that could go both ways. And this is a period where personal interactions are really key to making politics work. The first party system is not a party system in the way we have parties today. Uh, it was much harder to get consensus on a vote. So personal interactions, even more so than in the second party system in this early period, those personal interactions are key to making politics work. And that, in a way, gives an opening for women, especially as friends to men. So we're seeing here one woman who was very politically involved, Mercy Otis Warren. She had been friends with both George Washington and John Adams. She ended up ending those friendships over politics. Uh, and this just shows the importance of politics to women that you know, sometimes they're described in this period as, oh, they could interact with male politicians because they were outside of politics. Well, that's not really the case. They're pretty partisan, too, and they are mostly friends with men of the same party. But Mercy Otis Warren describes the role of a female friend in political interaction, and she says... I disregard the opinion that women make but indifferent politicians. When the observations are just and do honor to the heart and character, I think it very immaterial whether they flow from a female lip in the soft whispers of private friendship or whether thundered in the Senate in the bolder language of the other sex. And in fact, when she's talking about these soft whispers of friendship, we can think about the fact that women were allowed to sit on the floor of the House and Senate in Congress at various times. And you can imagine they apparently were crowding the floor during the Missouri Compromise uh, debates and votes in there in 1820. So you can imagine that they are having conversations with their male politician friends about how they're going to vote and what they are saying. They are very much in this political space. And while they cannot get up there and thunder their speech uh, in from a public podium, they can, in their friendships, have those discussions. Another example of a woman who was quite politically involved, you saw in my revised version of the cover, this is Elizabeth Powell, who lived in Philadelphia, and she was very close friends with George Washington. You may have heard of her. Uh, there are letters between Powell and Washington here in the collection, as well as between Powell and George Washington's nephew, Bushrod, who she was also friends with. And when Washington was considering not running for president uh, for re-election after his first term, she wrote him a pretty strongly worded letter. She emphasized to him the impracticality of carrying your intentions to effect and argued that his resignation would elate the enemies of good government. She said, as for the notion that others were equal to the task, if there's not a confidence in those abilities and that integrity, they cannot be beneficially applied. And she said, you are the only man in America that dares to do right on all public occasions. So she goes on at some length after apparently a private conversation between them in Philadelphia and really argues that he doesn't have a choice about this. He is the only person that can do this, and it's for the good of the country that he needs to run for president a second time. And Washington shared his intention to resign with Jefferson a month later. But after another two months, he told Jefferson he decided to run again as a result of strong solicitations in Philadelphia. Now, he had told Washington that, or Washington had told Jefferson that Jefferson and Madison were the only people he had discussed whether to run again with. He did not tell him he had ever talked to Elizabeth Powell about this. Jefferson was sometimes a little squeamish about women's involvement in politics, although if it was women he was friends with, he was fine with it. Um, <laughs> but we don't know whether Elizabeth Powell was the source of those strong solicitations in Philadelphia. Certainly her opinion carried weight with Washington. And we can see then that this friendship has an important political role to play. Finally, um, to go back to Eliza Park Custis, who we talked about before, let's see, I'll just leave it on Powell for a little while. She, as I mentioned, was friends with a man named David Bailey Warden, who spent some time in France. He had a diplomatic appointment, and then he lost that appointment. And 
Uh, Eliza was living in Washington at the time, and he wanted her to get that appointment for him back. He knew that she knew the Madisons and all sorts of other political figures. And so they wrote each other regularly. She would give him news of the political climate in Washington, who she had talked to. She tried to figure out who had prejudiced the Madisons against Warden when they removed him from his post. And she said in 1814, I never heard a word to your disadvantage from any of the government people. So clearly she's talking to a lot of different people in the government. She then told him all about the political climate in Washington and what was happening with finances, which since he was out of political office and in business in France, that was quite useful for him to know. So she really becomes a central source for his political and business careers while he is in France. I'll go back to this image again for you. I think in a more abstract sense, too, even when these friendships were not with an explicitly political figure, these were a value for the politics in the period. In a more abstract sense, these friendships represent the values of the early republic. Uh, equality in the sense that men and women in these friendships were roughly equal. This was not like a marriage where a man legally owned his spouse, where the wife was a man's property. This was an egalitarian relationship with give and take. There's also the matter of freedom and choice, important values in this period. And in these relationships, both the man and the woman could choose to leave that relationship whenever they wanted. So Mercy Otis Warren could choose to stop being friends with John Adams when he insulted her repeatedly in many letters uh, after she published a book he didn't like. So that choice is available in these friendships in ways that it's not in other relationships in this period, certainly not with family. Uh, family is family, choice or not. So these friendships are quite different there too. Finally, this idea of virtue that is so important in the period. Friendship in this period is supposed to foster virtue and virtue is going to help sustain the Republic. So these friendships between men and women have a role to play in fostering virtue and thus shoring up the connections that are going to bind the American people together. So where does all of this leave us? Uh, from the point of view of where it leaves us with George Washington, I think we can see in his friendships with women a more playful personal side to him. Uh, that poem that I showed you from Annis Boudinot Stockton, when she sent him a poem at one point, he replied playfully that, um, and she apologized for sending it, that he didn't mind, it was just fine, and for punishment, she would have to come have dinner with him. And some people have actually seen this letter as, oh, there was flirtation or an affair. And this is just a playfulness that was part of these friendships, even in the case of George Washington. I think more broadly, uh, I think we need to understand politics in this period as really built on personal relationships. And that means including women. So we tend to think of, you know, these founding men, and we should really be thinking about a society of founding men and women. I think we also need to understand that there is a much greater flexibility in gender roles and relationships in this period than we might imagine. And certainly other historians are showing us this as well, but these friendships are a particular example where we see women can be equal to men, women can be mentors for men. Um, they have very different sorts of relationships than we might expect. Finally, if we think about what this might tell us about today, I think certainly marriage has been in the news a lot lately, and we might think about the fact that there are actually multiple relationships that can give people happiness. Um, and with all the discussion of multiple forms of sexuality in America today, people might also think about multiple forms of love and that there are other forms of love between men and women beyond the romantic. We can look more broadly at love and relationships than we do now. So despite the fact that there were many more risks and restrictions in the past for men and women, the founding generation made these friendships work. And I do think that that's a lesson for us today about the possibilities for relationships and how we create the fabric of our society. Thank you. Okay.
uh, I'm going to ask the first question as the prerogative of the founding director. And, and uh, I thought that was fantastic, Cassie. I love this last image you end with. Look at all those sly eyeballs looking at you. <laughs> uh, everybody's got a little secret to tell here. Uh, it's really, you really ended powerfully, I think. I particularly like the notion of the personal relationships crucial in the political realm. But one thing also that struck me in your talk, as well as the book, which everybody should purchase the book, it's fantastic, uh, is this notion of the, the, the play that went into the writing of, of many of these, these figures when they're dealing with a person on an equal relationship who's of the opposite gender. And, uh, and Washington, in particular, is a person who writes so few uh, letters that allow you to really get at his personality. He's such a workaday kind of guy, and he's telling people what to do a lot. Uh, and these are people that he can't tell what to do, A, and he values their, their minds, clearly. And another person uh, that came, came to my mind, one of the greatest letters that he ever wrote is this letter he wrote uh, to Catherine Macaulay Graham, who, you know, the great uh, Whig historian mm -hmm. who's English. They clearly have a friendship uh, that's intense. He writes the great letter when he becomes president to her and says, I walk on untrodden ground. Everything I do is subject to two interpretations. Everything I do is open to precedent. And it's a great letter from him because he wouldn't have written that to a man. There's a certain vulnerability, I think, that he's allowing himself to her. But what, what are some other, and the great example you do with Jefferson, and that's the, a little rebellion now and then is a good thing. It's in that letter to Abigail. It, it's interesting that we don't often think about the context of who they're writing to enough when we're quoting you know, these guys and say, well, they, they wrote this or they wrote that. It really, that relationship is necessary to really fill it in. Yeah, I do think that there's a lot of figures. I mentioned John Randolph before, who plenty of people would just say, this guy was a jerk. And in fact, one of my advisors, when I was first working on this project, said, you can't write about John Randolph being nice. He wasn't nice. And I said, well, he was nice in this situation. Um, it, people have different sides to them. And I think we really see that through these relationships. There's uh, also somebody that is somewhat known uh, in a little bit later period, Willie Mallory Channing, who I write about, who was a uh, early transcendentalist Unitarian minister. And he has a female friend who he tries to boss around at a certain point and is critical of her. And she just says, I don't want you to talk to me that way. And he apologizes profusely and says, I'm going to learn from you're telling me this. I need to learn how to be better at this. And so you do see that mutual improvement that on both sides, people are learning about themselves and about how to be in relationships from these friendships. Thank you very much. All right, let's open it up, have a good conversation here. Wait till the mic gets to you. Because uh, we are uh, live streaming this, and so people online who are watching this great excitement can, can hear what you have to say. I saw your hand up go first. It's known that Jefferson and um, Adams were estranged for a number of years. Did Abigail and Jefferson continue to write? Did this affect their friendship? It did affect their friendship. So John Adams stopped being friends with Jefferson for before Abigail did. And she finally got to a breaking point and just said no. And she later said to him it was because of the election between the two and that Jefferson's people had said personal things about her husband. And she just couldn't take that. The only time they actually wrote each other in this period um, after that was when Jefferson's daughter died and Abigail had known the daughter and wrote a letter of condolence and Jefferson was hoping they could be friends again and she pretty much said no. Um, they did not reconcile at the same time as John Adams did. A couple of years after that, she writes a PS in a letter from John to Thomas Jefferson just saying hello, and he writes her back a whole letter, basically, I'm so glad to hear from you. And so they did keep writing each other for a few more years before she died. Hi, I'd like to get back to Catherine Macaulay Graham, because I think out of uh, all the women you've got uh, on the screen right now, she's a real outlier, and I hope you explore in the book why George Washington remained friends with her when not only was she, um, she was an independent historian getting paid for it, plus she was really in England shunned at this right. point. And he obviously ignores that. There were people here in the United States who wouldn't meet with her because she had been shunned. 
and please tell me you talk about it. Well, unfortunately, I did research on that, and I think in terms of, so I could not include every single example of a friendship I came across. And I usually tried to stick to examples where the people had actually met each other in person at some point and, or, and knew each other for a sort of longer span. Um, so that I had more of that, you know, personal thing versus, but it certainly would fit in in certain ways in other ways. Um, yeah, there are calculations to make there in terms of who you're going to stay friends with. And that is a tricky one for him to have made. You're right. Just a practical question. Uh, two of the portraits you have there you didn't talk about in your talk. Top left. Who's uh, the gentleman? Which are you pointing to here? Very top left. Uh, the one of Martha? No, beside her. The man. He's the gentleman. Oh, the, the gentleman. Sorry. That's James Monroe. And he's up. The, I work on the papers of James Monroe. So uh, I have Monroe here. He did have one female friend. There's only a couple letters between them, like two. And the so. woman to the right of Benjamin Franklin. See, I'm trying to see from the side. Uh, that was Angelica Schuyler Church. It's a kind of strange portrait of her. It also has her children in it that are sort of, that I've cropped out there. I think we've got the rest, but thank you. <laughs> Next question we'll get from that side. Go ahead, Mary. Uh, do you, did you write anything about the friends of Benjamin Franklin? Because I understand he had quite a few. When yes. <laughs> yes, I did write about Franklin and his friends. In fact, there's a there's a wonderful image that I sometimes show in presentations of a woman sitting on his lap when he's over in, uh, I think it's when he's in London. And part of what is going on with Franklin here, as well as with a few other men when they are actually in Europe, is that the norms of sexuality are different among the elite in England and France. There is a lot more flexibility here for flirtation and even for affairs, especially in France. And so that affects the kind of relationships they have. In Franklin's case, I think in most, with most of those women, they were flirtatious friendships. Uh, there's one expert on Franklin who thinks that there was probably just one he was actually pursuing romantically. We don't really know. Uh, we can't really know with him. There are some other men, um, Governor Morris, who actually writes in his diary about who he's sleeping with when he's in Paris. So we actually know. Uh, but in the case of Ben Franklin, we know he's flirtatious. We know that he is significantly older than many of these women and that there is a sort of playful flirtatious friendship that is available in France and England that is not common in America. Someone from that side. Anyone? Interesting. Well, anyone anywhere. Then. <laughs> yeah. The photo or the, the drawing of uh, Margaret Barrett Smith in 1829, and I think Jefferson died in 1826. So she would have been significantly younger than he was when they were friends when he was president. What, what is the age difference? I'm trying to remember the exact year that she was born. She was probably guessing, I'm trying to remember, probably about 15 years younger. Plenty of these friendships, there is a fairly big age gap, and that, in fact, makes it much easier because you don't have this same concern in many cases. It, you know, it can be a father-daughter type relationship or there's more of a mentorship. I don't think that that age difference played that much into their relationship. Um, for her, it was sort of an intellectual she and she respected his politics a lot. Uh, she shared the same politics. So the age gap didn't really come up for them as much as in some other cases. When I was in Philadelphia with my family, we took uh, one of the historical tours um, and um, the docent said that um, George Washington, during many of the social gatherings, was dancing a lot with Kitty Green. Mm -hmm. So does this name ring a bell? I know yes. she's General Green's wife, from what I understand. Right. So did they have a friendship, or was just there were more acquaintances? 
They, I think that they were friendly, um, if not friends. And she was friends with other men as well. She was also friends with Franklin, um, closer friends with Franklin. And so, yeah, there are a number of letters from her that I have looked at. And yeah, I have seen these stories that, you know, oh, maybe this is something else that they were dancing together for a while. But again, I think this is something where, especially this is in a public venue. Um, this was something that, would have been okay socially. No. Um, okay. I know. Um, sure. We'd like to think that you somewhere mentioned something about Sally Fairfax and George Washington. That really is a very much interest to us out here. Uh, yes. So. I have read some about Sally Fairfax. That relationship happens a bit before the time period I cover in the book. Uh, I think that there was a, you know, at least on his part, at least a crush. Um, we were discussing this before the talk. Uh, I think just because somebody has a crush does not mean it is not a friendship. And there's also the fact that after George married Martha, they stayed friends as a couple with the Fairfaxes. So whatever might have been there at some point, and I think that that's true in multiple friendships where there may have been some sort of romantic attraction at some point, but then it becomes a friendship over the longer term. Back to Franklin. I haven't quite forgiven him yet for not coming home when his wife died. Was, was that because transit was so difficult or... Was he that uh, so the question, in case people didn't hear, was uh, why Franklin didn't come home when his wife died. And, you know, Franklin was much better to his female friends than to his female fam family members. He never wrote the kind of intellectual letters to his daughter that he wrote to uh, or to his wife that he wrote to his female friends. He just had this totally different relationship with them. Um, he... If you read the letters, it's just a totally different tone, and you can see it's quite different. Uh, there's a great book called Benjamin Franklin and Women that is an edited collection of articles about Franklin and the different women in his life, and uh, that gets at some of this. But yes, he clearly didn't have the same kind of relationship with his wife, and uh, I mean, it would have been a difficult trip, but certainly people made that trip back and forth if they wanted to. You know, it, it strikes me too the, uh, the the different relationship between the letters between these friends and their spouses uh, is a challenge, I think, for historians because of the conventions of letter writing. What we were just talking about, about the way you can be playful with someone who's in this different kind of relationship. Elizabeth Powell famously writes to Washington that she has, and of course, we don't have the correspondence between Mar thank you, Martha, between them. <laughs> But she has some letters of George's to Martha in her possession and writes that these don't look like the letters of Amore. And so what, I mean, what do, we, what do you make of that as someone who's a student of letter writing and, and all kinds of different relationships? Well, I think, I, I, as I remember in that correspondence, what had happened, George Washington had spent a lot of time in Elizabeth Powell's house in Philadelphia. And he left this packet of letters in the desk. And she writes and says, I found these letters. I didn't look at them uh, just to protect your privacy. Let Martha know I did not look at them. And I can send them to you. And he wrote back and he said, you know, you really wouldn't see anything salacious in there at my age, basically, is what he says. So uh, that, that there, he actually says they're more like letters of friendship at this stage. That's right. That, thank you. That, that's good. Well, I love <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's get one more really good moving question before we shake everybody down. Come on. <laughs> Do you cover uh, anything about Hamilton and Angelica Church? Yeah, so Hamilton uh, was Angelica Schuyler Church's brother-in-law. And I initially did have a bit on their friendship, which some people thought was an affair, and it may very well have been. Their letters are more affectionate than you would often see between male-female friends. Uh, but the reason I ended up not including that is because of this sibling-in-law 
issue here where they were actually they would have been seen as a brother and sister. Um, but there are there is great correspondence between them. And it's interesting that at the same time it, that they are friends, Angelica Schuyler Church is friends with Jefferson. And they're talking about politics in both of in both of those relationships. So, yeah, that that is an interesting one that may well have had a romantic component. That's fantastic. So the final question, then a private one, which I think I, I can ask because we're also good friends now. Which is, do you have good male? <laughs> yes, in fact, uh, many of my close friends, especially from graduate school, are men. And certainly when I came up with the idea for this project, it came partially from the fact that I had close male friends and actually didn't think that there was good language in our society now even to describe that or convince people that I was friends and it was not a romantic relationship. All right. Well, thank you very much for that. And thank you for this. Thank you. So two elements to point out. Uh, we have books for sale right outside of this door, and Cassie will be at this desk. We won't allow her to leave until everybody has a book signed who wants one. The two other things I want to point out is the book for sale here is cheaper than it is on Amazon, which is amazing, <laughs> thanks to Mount Vernon uh, and what we're offering, and also that we've kept the inn open tonight till 9 o'clock if people wanted to go down and get uh, some dinner at the Mount Vernon Inn. You have a drink. It would be fun, too. Anyway, so Cassie, you come on over here. All right. Let's give her another big round of applause. <laughs> Next time.